Good morning. I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Member Engagement Librarian at the South Central Regional Library Council. So welcome to today's webinar on focus groups. This webinar is the final webinar in the Practical Library Assessment Series from the Empire State Library Network. And if you're interested in any of the previous assessment webinars, the recordings are available on YouTube, and I'm going to post the link in the chat box. And there is one final workshop in the series on designing surveys that will be coming this July, so keep your eyes out for that one. And now I would like to welcome today's speakers. We have Jane Powers. She's the director of ACT for Youth Center of Excellence at Cornell University, and Amanda Purington, the director of evaluation and research at ACT for Youth Center of Excellence at Cornell. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Great. We're, we're glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jane Powers, and as Jessica said, I direct the Act for Youth Center of Excellence, and I'm here with my colleague, Amanda Purrington, uh, who's also with the Center of Excellence, and she is the director of our evaluation and research efforts. So we are delighted to be here to share with you some of what we have learned in doing focus groups over the last decade. Just by way of background, uh, the ACT, COE, we call it, is an intermediary organization. We've been funded since 2000 by the New York State Department of Health. We support the DOH-funded grantees who work primarily in the area of adolescent health. We provide them with training, technical assistance, evaluation, and also develop and disseminate resources. Much of our work involves translating research so it will be useful for practitioners and policymakers. And for those who are unfamiliar with our website, it's on this slide, I encourage you to check us out. We have a rich treasure trove of resources on youth development, on adolescent sexual health, and many other topics. So um, just check us out. So focus groups. We started doing them at the request of our funder, the New York State Department of Health, who wanted to learn more about what youth in New York State thought about particular topics. Our very first project involved adolescent sexual health. The health department wanted to know where are youth getting their information, what's been their experience getting services, and what are their recommendations for improving sexual health of their peers in New York State. And the really great thing about our work in doing focus groups is that the health department t takes these findings and, and really integrates them into their programs, initiatives, and policies, or they use them to develop media campaigns. So they've, they have said the focus group data are amazingly valuable to their work. Um, so um, we actually did this. Um, presentation as a, a, a live workshop on Monday um, for people at Cornell. So this is really different now doing it as a webinar, but it was really interesting to have everybody go around and say what they were interested, you know, why they were doing focus groups and, and what their area what areas of interest was. And it just cuts across everything from medicine, law, design, climate change, nutrition. Um, and so while we can't do that today, um, what we wanted to do was just a little poll, um, and I'm going to turn this over to Jessica just to find out about the experience, the collective experience of, of those who are on um, the webinar this morning. And so um, the first question that we wanted to ask was whether you have ever been in a focus group. So select whether or not you have, yes or no. So it looks like 77% said no and 23% said yes. Okay. All right. So what about have um, you ever conducted a focus group? So 69% said no, 31% said yes. Okay. About a third of you have done that. All right. And finally, um, have you ever analyzed focus group data? We were doing this for a group of researchers at Cornell, so that was one question that was a big, big one of interest. Ah. So 43% have and 57% okay. have not. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Jessica. Sure. Um, so there is experience here, and uh, we hope that this session is helpful to you and will reinforce what you're either doing or add some new ideas. 
uh, please use the chat box to ask questions along the way. We are really happy to um, stop and answer anything and try to be as interactive as we can. Um, we also should have plenty of time at the end for some question and answers, and we're always happy to follow up with any of you um, after this. If you have other questions along the way, um, our contact information is on the final slide. And the slides and our handouts will be sent to you after the webinar. We have several handouts in addition to the slides. So I think we're ready to go. I guess I get to move the next slide. Yeah. All right, let me do that. This one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's where we're going this morning on the topics that we're going to cover. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about whether or not the focus group is the right approach to take. Then we are going to talk about um, the essential aspect of planning for focus groups and what goes into that. We'll then get into some of the real brass tacks about how to conduct a focus group. We'll share some ideas on how we best record the information and then discuss you know, some of the techniques that we use to manage data and also to analyze data. I mean, we could do an entire webinar on just analyzing focus group data, so we're just going to really touch on this. Then we'll give some examples of how we've reported out findings. If you have any burning questions about focus groups that you want us to discuss, you can type them into the chat. Um, and we can see if we can integrate that in, but th this is really where we're going. All right, so let's go. So first we want to talk about whether or not focus groups are the right approach to take. It's really important to think about this and not just jump into it. We learn this the hard way in our own work, sometimes realizing, you know, we really should have done a survey to find out this information. Um, they're costly, they're, they're, they are time intensive and resource intensive, so you really need to make sure this is the way to go. The purpose of the focus group is to listen and gather information. You want to find out what certain people think about an issue, a product, or a particular service. Focus groups are used to identify trends and patterns in perceptions. Um, they've had a long and history, a long and interesting history. Um, uh, you know, when focus groups, how they how they've evolved um, over time. Uh, in the late 1930s, social scientists began investigating the value of what they called non-directive individual interviewing as an improved method to gather information. They questioned their traditional techniques for gathering information that relied primarily on questionnaires with predetermined close-ended response choices, and they sought strategies where researchers were less dominating. They began conducting what they called non-directed interviews, which used open-ended questions and allowed individuals to respond without setting boundaries or forcing people into response categories. This set the stage for focus group methodology. But it wasn't until Robert Merton and his colleagues wrote in 1956 a seminal book called The Focused Interview, which laid out many of the procedures that are very common focus group practice that we use today. In the following decades, most applications of focus group interviews were in the area of market research, a very popular method to help producers and manufacturers understand the thinking of consumers. Focus groups have been used as a crucial step in developing marketing strategies. It wasn't until the 80s and 90s where social scientists rediscovered focus groups. Um, this coincided with a greater interest in, and acceptance of qualitative data. But focus groups have really become increasingly popular um, in, for nonprofits, academic research, participatory research, and international research. And they have a lot of value. They provide information about why people think or feel the way they do. They can help improve planning and design of new programs or evaluate existing programs. They can provide insights into developing market, marketing strategies and, you know, provide valuable information for the decision makers. As I said, our funder, um, they really love focus group findings. They find them incredibly helpful. So why do they work? 
Well, we're a product of our environment, and we get influenced by people around us. We form opinions, not in isolation, but by listening to others. While some opinions are developed quickly and held with absolute certainty, others are malleable and dynamic. Evidence from focus groups suggests that people influence each other with their comments, and opinions may shift in the course of the conversation. Focus groups analysts can discover how that shift occurred and the nature of the influencing factors. So again, when we're talking about whether or not focus groups are the right approach, what about interviews? Why would we use those? Interviews are one-on-one -on -one conversations, and they're really good for exploring topics in depth. You can ask open-ended questions, and you can gather sensitive information. They are great for collecting qualitative data and provide very rich stories. However, what you don't get is the ability for respondents to talk to each other and have their comments build on each other's comments. Focus groups allow for group interaction and can provide insight into why certain opinions are held. Okay, surveys. We all do surveys where respondents have to choose from predetermined response options. Surveys are great for collecting information about people's <coughs> attitudes and attributes. The advantage is that you can include a lot more people and collect information systematically. Your information will have more statistical power with which to analyze your results. Surveys serve a very different purpose than focus groups. In surveys, the choices are predetermined, although you could, there is room for some open-ended responses, but more often, respondents are choosing from a list and you can miss important data if you don't have the right response option. I'm sure many of us have seen that in our work. Surveys assume that people know how they feel, but sometimes they really don't. Sometimes it takes listening to the opinions of others in a small and safe group setting before they form thoughts and opinions. Focus groups are really well suited for those situations. And they can actually help in survey development, and that's one of the ways that we've used them. They can generate um, what are the right questions to ask and what response options should you include. And these findings um, can be used to develop your survey to gather responses from a lot more people in a more systematic and broader way. So with focus groups, you involve multiple participants who, during the course of a conversation, generate their own responses and build on responses of others. People talk to each other. Responses are open-ended. So to summarize, what's unique about the focus group is that they involve people, typically 7 to 10 in a group, the size must be small enough for everyone to have an opportunity to share insights and yet large enough to provide diversity of perceptions. Who possess certain characteristics, they are homogeneous in some specific way. Uh, the nature of this is determined by the purpose of the study, and Mandy will talk more about this when we discuss recruitment. Focus groups provide qualitative data. They are led by a trained facilitator or moderator who leads the group through a focused discussion to help understand a topic, to go deep. Use a focus group when you want to generate a range of ideas, when you want to understand differences in perspectives between groups or categories of people, and uncover factors that influence opinions, behavior, and motivation. Ideally, participant comments will stimulate and influence the thinking and sharing of others. Some people may even change their thoughts and opinions during the focus group. Understanding how those shifts happen is another interesting feature of the focus group methodology. Don't use a focus group in these situations. When you want consensus, when you want to educate people, if you want to um, obtain sensitive information, this is not the way to go. When, when you need statistical projections, when you lack confidential confidentiality, um, and when a topic could be potentially 
conflicting. You really don't want to use a focus group for that. Other methods will yield better information or be less costly. And again, I just want to stress the fact that you can't ensure confidentiality when you're doing a focus group, but we will talk about how we discuss confidentiality in a little bit. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. Okay. Um, so, you know, as, as we've kind of been alluding to here, a good focus group really requires quite a bit of planning. Um, so there, there's definitely more to it than just kind of inviting a few people uh, together to kind of casually share their opinions about a topic. We have to be a bit more strategic. So here are some things to really think about when you're developing your, your focus group study. So first, what's your, what is your purpose? You know, what is the, the driving reason for gathering this information? And then second, what kinds of information do you really want? Um, that will definitely help shape your questions. And then what types of information are important to gather? Another consideration is who wants the information? So how will this be used? Um, who is looking for the answers to these questions? Uh, you'll also want to consider ethical, legal, or social considerations that might weigh into the questions that you ask or don't ask or how you phrase those questions. But then finally, what resources do you have? So um, as Jane mentioned, you know, focus groups can be rather costly to implement. And so thinking about um, what resources do we have available uh, to, to implement these focus groups. So we just we wanted to ask a quick question here. If you are considering a focus group or if you have done a focus group in the past, could you chat in um, kind of what the purpose of the focus group was? What were your reasons for conducting a focus group? So we're not seeing much activity here. Our next focus group is going to be on why webinar participants don't chat into webinars. <laughs> <laughs> here they come. <laughs> so on oh, okay. website development, strategic planning, oh. we used focus groups to find out what obstacles students encounter when conducting research. Okay. Um, somebody says to gather information about injury prevention from different farms throughout the nation. Another says repurposing space. Um, and another says we held multiple focus groups for planning our five-year plan, our strategic plan. Right. And Mary Carroll says for those I've been involved in to evaluate services. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah great. So we're hearing kind of a range of things, everything from um, you know, program planning or planning services to evaluating how well those are working. And so I think that really resonates with a lot of how we've, we've used focus groups and how we've seen focus groups used. So that's great. Okay. So um, here are some broad considerations to keep in mind as you're developing your focus group questions. <clears throat> so first, phrasing of those questions is really important. We want to make sure that the questions that we ask actually evoke conversation. So we want to make sure that they're not going to elicit one or two word answers. Second, it's really important to use language that will resonate with your participants. So for example, for one of our focus group projects, we wanted to know why young people weren't participating in the family planning benefit here in New York State. But for many young people, even if they're using that benefit, they might not know it by that name. So we had to be sure to use language that our youth participants would know and be familiar with. So making sure that the, the words are, are things that are familiar. And the last kind of broad consideration here is uh, really to help you as a facilitator. So um, it's a good idea to really say the questions out loud um, as you're working on them and just make sure that you're using words that are, are um, easy to say. You don't want to accidentally create a, a tongue twister for yourself. So, um, you know, it goes both ways, words that are easy to say and, and questions that are easy to understand. Um, some uh, additional considerations as you're developing your questions, you want to really keep your questions really clear and really short. Uh, you want to make sure that they understand what you're asking and that they can keep the question in mind as they consider their response. 
So because it is something that happens in conversation, the only reminder that they have of the question itself is what you have said. You know, they don't have a visual cue of the question necessarily. So try to keep it clear and short. Um, and since one of the main benefits of a focus group is generating a host of different ideas, you want to make sure that the way your, your questions are asked present this opportunity. So we really want to keep them open-ended. We don't want yes or no questions. Um, and one tip is if you find that you've written a yes or no question in your brainstorming phase, you can often rephrase it to kind of open it up a bit more. So, for example, you could change a question like, do you use library services, which could be answered with just a yes or a no, to how do you use library services. So then you're, you're looking, uh, you're opening that up for more uh, broad discussion. The questions themselves should be pretty focused, and each question should ask about only one dimension of a topic. So it can be very easy to create kind of what we call double-barreled questions, where you're really asking two things in one. Um, and as you're refining your questions, if you find that you've done this, you can really um, either decide which of those dimensions is really the critical one that you want to ask about, or consider breaking them apart into two questions. Um, so as Jane mentioned, we've done focus groups with adolescents around the topic of sexual health and where they get information. Um, so we might want to know both where they get information and whether or not they trust these sources. But we can't ask that in one question. We would really need to break that apart into two. Um, the, you might you really also want to consider what it would be like to answer these questions in a group setting. So you, want, you don't want the questions themselves to be threatening or embarrassing to the participants. And one strategy that we have for kind of addressing that is uh, framing the question so that you are asking about um, other people and not necessarily specifically about those who are in the room. So again, kind of going back to our adolescent sexual health uh, focus groups, we phrased all of the questions to ask about young people your age. So rather than asking a question about where do you go for reproductive health services, we asked where do young people you know go for reproductive health services. So of course, you know, a lot of the answers that people are giving you probably reflect their own personal experience, but by asking this question in a way that, that kind of puts it out there that we're not asking about their individual experience, uh, they might feel a little bit more comfortable in responding to those questions. And once you have a draft of your questions, you want to start developing the overall structure of these questions. You want to make sure the order uh, makes sense to your participants and that they flow from one to the other. And you also want to work on your transitions between one subtopic and the next to make sure that they make sense. Um, you might want to add a few lines of script introducing a new section or topic. This is something that we recently had experience with. Uh, there was, um, you know, we felt a pretty clear distinction between the first section and the second section of questions. But when we piloted these focus groups, we found that the participants weren't picking up on that distinction. And so we ended up adding uh, a transition sentence or two to really call attention to uh, how these next questions are kind of slightly different from what we were just talking about. So that's another plug for make sure you pilot your questions <laughs> before you go live. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that too. Um, you'll also want to identify what your key questions are and think about their placement in the overall structure of your focus group. So it might take participants a few questions to kind of get warmed up and get comfortable in responding. Uh, to questions in this kind of a setting. So you probably don't want to have your key questions be the very first ones you ask. You'll want to start with, with some easier ones. Um, but you probably also don't want to save those questions for the very end because you might formulate some follow-up questions kind of on the spot and you want to make sure that you have time to ask those follow-up questions uh, in the course of your focus group and not run out of time. A common question is kind of how many questions should there be in a focus group. Uh, there's no one right answer to this, uh, no magic formula here. It does depend on your focus, uh, you know, what's your purpose here, how many prompts you have under each of those sections, uh, and to what extent you have or anticipate uh, creating follow-up questions. 
Um, but again, you want to keep in mind that your goal is to really get a discussion going amongst the group. So it's not really a battery of questions that the facilitator is asking, but really just kind of ways to touch on your key topics and promote conversation so that most of the talking is being done by your participants. So how many questions, if we kind of get down to <laughs> that key question? Um, I would say probably uh, 12 questions would be a maximum. Um, 10 is better, and probably eight main questions is more ideal. Again, you might have some specific prompts that follow each of your main questions, so you can get a little bit more nuanced there. Um, but you, you really want to limit your main questions. So this, this slide here kind of outlines the broad process for developing your questions. Definitely start with a brainstorming session. It's great to invite a few people together to think about this. Like, what are the things that we want to know? Um, then you're going to really work on the phrasing of the question, keeping in mind things like, you know, making sure that they're one-dimensional, keeping them clear and short. Um, then you're going to really want to think about the sequencing, which we did kind of talk a little bit about. So in addition to kind of starting with an introductory question before you move into your key questions, you also want to think about these factors here. So you want to start your questions off so that you're asking more generally before you ask about specific things. Um, and you also want to ask questions that are more positive before negative. And additionally, you want to keep them really broad and open-ended with no prompts before you then suggest prompts. So um, these, these can be helpful um, as you're thinking about the flow and the order of your questions. So this is actually um, a set of example questions. Um, it comes from one of the great resources that we have uh, listed in the end of uh, the slide set here. But you can see they have an opening question, which the purpose here is really to just kind of get everyone in the group to say something so that they get a little bit more comfortable sharing in this group setting. And we have an introductory question, um, again, kind of framing to this topic, just getting people going. Um, and then we kind of transition and move into the key questions. So these key questions are really the things that uh, the facilitators are, are looking to get information about. And then these ending questions are great ways to kind of wrap things up. Um, also, you can open it up really broadly and ask participants to, um, you know, is there anything else that you would like to know? If you had a chance to give advice to the director, what advice would you get? So they can be a lot broader, and um, but also help kind of conclude the focus group. Is it my turn? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as part of developing your questions and, and getting your focus group ready for launch, you really want to, um, as much as you can, pilot, all right? So you want to um, first kind of estimate what amount of time you want to give to each question, all right? Um, so thinking back over those intro questions and um, Laying the, laying the groundwork for the focus group questions. Um, make sure that you're going to have enough time to get to the one, the really key questions you want. Get feedback on the questions that you're thinking of asking, okay? And then revise those questions based on it. And then, and then pilot them with a group. I mean, I can't um, really um, underestimate the value of, of a pilot and um, this, this this little drawing shows you how you you know it's a cyclical process but you know you could you could really getting the questions right and the words right um, is something really important to do I, I want to let you know that um, the Act Youth Center of Excellence actually works with a group of, of youth consultants consultants in New York City and there's we don't do anything without um, in terms of focus groups and surveys without running things by our ACT youth network who really you know are terrific and telling us no we don't you know use this word for this nobody would answer they wouldn't know what you're talking about and um, and lots of our materials they review but if anyone is interested and said, boy, we'd really like a group of adolescents to take a look at these questions. They, they are available, and they do this work for free, and they're wonderful. So, so just contact me if anybody wants 
to take um, uh, take advantage of this wonderful resource that we have as part of the Center of Excellence. They love reviewing um, researchers' uh, focus group questions, and they are terrific. So um, it's spend time on this. This is a very important part of your planning stage. <clears throat> Okay. Um, so now that we have these really great focus group questions, they've been piloted um, and we feel really good about them, um, it's really time to think about recruitment. Uh, and a uh, key kind of overarching frame here is to remember your purpose. So why are we conducting this focus group? So um, thinking back to those questions that were in the thought bubbles, right? So what kind of information do we want to know? Um, who is interested in getting the answers to these questions? How might we use this information? So keeping that in mind will help us determine who it is that we want to ask these questions of. So that leads to your participant characteristics. So who do you want to hear this information from? Uh, you know, as, as we've kind of given some examples, a lot of our focus groups are working with youth. Um, so. Are we interested in getting information or perspectives from youth in different regions? So for example, those living in uh, rural areas compared to those living in urban areas. Um, is it important for us to get perspectives from males versus females? Um, you might have different uh, participant roles that are important. So. Um, consumers versus uh, organization directors, staff versus consumers, things like that. Um, group composition is something else you want to think about. So the participant characteristics might kind of drive different groups that you would have. So for example, when we were doing those uh, on reproductive health with uh, young people, we did split them into male and female groups. We knew we wanted to get perspectives from both males and females, but we also decided that we wanted to split them apart by males and females. So think about that with your group composition. The idea here is that you really want to bring together people who share a common characteristic and that that is going to help inform your purpose. So for example, um, if you're doing a focus group where you want to learn about an adult community education program, um, you want to think about the homogeneity of the group. So you would think about adults who live in the community and haven't yet attended the uh, community education uh, that has been offered, right? So the group, the members of the group themselves might really vary by age or gender, um, but they are all residents of this particular community and non-users of this education program. So you want to think about, you know, these participant characteristics and group composition questions kind of do go hand in hand. And also, it's, well, I should say too that the, kind of the ideal is that you would have a homogenous group of strangers in the group. And the reason for this is that the homogeneity really kind of levels the playing field and um, the anonymity reduces inhibitions amongst people because they might not ever see each other again, right? So they might be really more willing to share their uh, perspectives in this kind of group of strangers that they, they share this common characteristic with. We do know that that's the ideal and sometimes not always possible, um, but again, we're just kind of putting out these parameters for ideal ways to create this. And along those lines, thinking about the size of the group, so how many people should actually be in a single focus group together? Um, probably between six and ten participants is best. You really don't want to have more than 12 people in a single group. So you want to have enough people to generate a rich discussion, but not so large that some participants either get left out or uh, you end up having the group kind of become fragmented with side conversations going on. Uh, you also don't want to have them be too small. Um, smaller groups can have advantages, but uh, the, the challenge there is that you may have fewer opinions and ideas shared just because there are fewer people in the group. Uh, but definitely smaller groups uh, can have easier logistics and can be easier to facilitate. So just keep that in mind, kind of 6 to 10 is probably the ideal number of participants in a single group. Um, but then that also gets into the number of groups. You know, how many groups, how many different groups should you conduct? Um, 
there definitely is a reason to, to think about this because, um, you know, as we've mentioned, conducting focus groups can be uh, costly, both for time and other resources. So you really want to think about how many do you need? Um, and drivers of the answer to this question would be uh, what kind of representation do you want? So what kinds of views are important to get here? Um, and, you know, I mentioned some of these things to consider um, if we're interested in getting different perceptions and experiences from males versus females, you know, there's at least a, a few groups there. Um, if we're looking at rural versus urban in addition to males versus females, you know, that kind of adds to the, the different dimensions, which leads to additional groups to conduct. Um, so you want to make sure that, that you're being mindful, again, of your purpose and the different perspectives that you're trying to, to gather here. Another thing uh, that might be possible is to kind of um, assess the number of groups as you're progressing with this work. So you might reach kind of a saturation point where you're hearing a lot of the same ideas and um, uh, opinions across groups. And once you get to that kind of saturation point, you might be able to say, okay, I think we've done enough focus groups at this point and we, we're not hearing new ideas at this point. So we are ready to, to stop at that point. Um, Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so with recruitment, you know, kind of reflecting all of those things, you really want to be very thoughtful and deliberate about the people you invite to participate in these groups. Um, you might use a variety of recruiting strategies. So one would be um, nominations from key individuals. So um, who are the, the people that would know something about this topic and could suggest individuals that you might want to have uh, be part of this group? Um, if possible, you could use random selection from a pool of uh, eligible participants. So for example, a lot of our work with youth, we've been able to work with youth serving organizations who have a variety of, of youth engaged in programming. And so uh, they, may, they might be able to select uh, young people from that programming to be part of these groups. Um, you can also piggyback on another event. So if you are uh, working with an organization that's pulling people together for some sort of an event, um, you could propose to do a focus group right after that event, say. So people are kind of already pulled together and planning to be at this location. Um, you can also, you know, do kind of broad recruitment through advertisements or flyers or emails. Um, and it's a, uh, that can definitely be a bit of a uh, challenge, but that definitely is a way to recruit, and we've, we've done that as well. Um, you might also want to consider tapping into the resources of, of your sponsoring organization. So for a lot of the focus groups that we've done with young people, um, as I said, you know, we've been able to work with youth serving agencies, and so they have a whole network of connections, um, not only to young people, but also to other organizations who work with youth. And so we've really been able to work with them to, to recruit um, and even find locations to conduct focus groups and things like that. Personalized invitations are a great way to go. There's nothing quite like having your name on there. You feel uh, that you're really um, being asked to participate. It does make a difference. And also, if, you're, if your resources were, will allow for it, I would strongly suggest considering providing incentives to your participants. Um, and speaking of incentives, so here are some ideas of things that you might be able to offer. Um, so offering money for individuals who participate, uh, we've often offered youth participants uh, $20 as kind of a thank you for participating and recognizing the time um, that they are spending with us and, and their willingness to share their ideas and thoughts. Food is always a great incentive. I think that kind of cuts across the board to just about anyone. <laughs> um, I know sometimes there are limitations on being able to provide cash, but you can also consider other gifts or gift certificates um, that have a monetary value. Um, sometimes people will offer a single big ticket item that's kind of a raffle, so all the participants will be put into the running, um, and then randomly one person or a few people would be drawn for a bigger ticket item. Um, again, thinking about the 
the people that you are recruiting for these groups, you might want to think about other things that would, that would make it easier for them to participate. So providing child care uh, might really be the thing that makes or breaks their ability to participate. So if you're able to do that, that actually in and of itself might be an incentive. Um, we kind of talked about this in recruitment strategies, but providing positive, upbeat invitations is kind of an incentive. So uh, as Jane mentioned, a lot of the focus groups that we've done have been on the behalf of the New York State Department of Health, and they really use this information in developing uh, programming and policy. And so let people know that, you know, you by contributing to this focus group, you could impact future programming, future services, um, and your ideas will really help. Uh, and that in and of itself can be an incentive. So <clears throat> I did want to ask a, one more kind of chat in opportunity, thinking about focus groups that you've conducted or focus groups that um, you're planning or considering, what kind of incentives have you found to be useful um, or, or do you think might appeal to your participants? If you can chat in, we'll give a moment and let people let Jessica report that. Right. Sure. Pizza appealed to most students. Oh. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, but the health department doesn't allow us to do that. It's on, their, on their list of no, uh, no serving, we're not letting you use our funds for pizza. Yeah, another yeah. comment, food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gift cards to local coffee places. Oh, that's good. Pizza and gift certificates to the bookstore. Oh, nice. Oh, oh, that's great. And only used for surveys so far, but found raffle effective to get responses. Excellent. Yeah. And before we move on, there was a question earlier about how somebody could get um, in touch with you if they wanted to run questions past your youth group. Ah, yeah, so at the end of um, this PowerPoint is my email address, um, but I can just tell everybody now it's easy, JLP5, the number 5, at cornell.edu, and so just get in touch with me, um, and I can connect you with our youth network. They'd be happy to help out. They love doing that work. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay. So kind of... Um, Okay, so now we've kind of identified uh, who we want to have participate. Um, some additional setup procedures here. So you want to set some meeting times for these groups. Always allocate more time than you're actually going to need for the conversation. So, you know, it's nice to kind of have a buffer at the beginning so people can kind of come in, um, get settled, introduce yourself um, informally. <clears throat> if you're offering food, that's a great opportunity for people to kind of get their food together, find a place to settle down. Um, it's great if you can uh, contact your participants ahead of time. Um, I would actually suggest, and this kind of relates to the last point here, that um, you stay in touch with them. So, um, you know, once they've committed to the, the focus group, just, you know, send them a quick reminder to let them know that the focus group is coming up. Uh, make sure they know where and when it is, if it's in a large building, that they know which room it's in. Um, making sure that we're sending all of this information personalized, again, really does make a difference. Um, we have been really lucky to work with those organizations who have direct connections to youth participants for many of the groups that we've done. Um, and they've actually been able to, they've been willing to do a lot of this work for us and with us, which is really great because um, they have connections to the young people already. So this is kind of building on the relationships that they have. So if you're able to work with an organization or an existing program that has relationships with your participants, that is a really great way to kind of make sure that those, those people you've been recruiting to participate actually do show up. Um, so building on relationships whenever possible is a, a great strategy. Um, when it comes to actually the day of the focus group, um, you want to make sure that you're making it as easy as possible for them to attend. So scheduling in, in time, uh, off times for your participants that, they'll, that they actually have the availability to attend. So that can often mean during the evening or on the weekend. Um, in some cases, 
uh, depending on location, helping with transportation can really make a big difference. Um, this has definitely come up for us, particularly working with young people. Um, you know, it can be hard for them to get to these locations, so either providing transportation or providing funds for transportation can be um, a real benefit to getting, getting people to attend. Offering child care, so we kind of talked about that, but that can really help facilitate uh, them actually coming. Um, interpreter services, that can also obviously be key if you're working with people who are maybe um, speaking another language or American Sign Language, you know, so thinking about what's going to make it easy for people to attend and participate. Um, the, the setting, we'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide as well, but um, you want to make sure it's a place that uh, is comfortable for people. So um, being pretty thoughtful about where the focus group will actually take place. Unless we're doing focus groups with students, we don't have people come to Cornell campus. It's just not um, easy for people to navigate. Parking is not easy. We want to go someplace that's easy for them, someplace that's convenient for them. Um, also, you want to think about um, the, the location within whatever building you're in. Um, obviously, we want it to be a safe place, but also think about confidentiality. So if you're meeting in um, a you know, community-based organization or um, another uh, organization in the community, you want to still make sure that you're in a room where you can close the door and kind of have a confidential, quiet space where you won't have um, interruptions or other people kind of walking by or through. You also really want to think about the room setup. So again, thinking in advance, does this space work for this purpose? Um, ideally, you'll have all of the participants uh, be able to see each other because, again, we're trying to facilitate conversation about this issue. So we want to be able to see them, see each other, uh, build on each other's uh, conversation, hear each other. So having um, desks that are all facing the front of a room or something, for example, is not really conducive to a focus group, but rather setting chairs up in a circle or, or all around, sitting around a large table together um, is a much better setup. Okay, so um, now we're just going to talk a little bit about who should conduct the focus group. And facilitators can really make or break the focus group, and facilitator characteristics are incredibly important. You really want someone who can listen and think at the same time, who is attentive, sensitive, sensitive and, and have empathy. You want someone who respects participants and can show it, who believes that all group participants have something to offer no matter what their level of education, experience, or background. So it's really important to display that kind of respect. You also want a facilitator who has adequate knowledge of the topic being discussed and that can really keep their personal views and ego out of the facilitation and really um, doesn't express that. Um, it should be someone that the group can relate to. Um, and we have broken this rule on multiple occasions because of having to schedule groups um, under tight schedules. And so, for example, you know, I'm a white middle-aged woman who did a focus group with inner city African American um, middle school boys about health behaviors. And that really wasn't ideal. You should have a male facilitator is most appropriate for a group of all men discussing sexual harassment in the, in the workplace. So you really need to think about that. But again, you know, these are the ideals. I mean, you can't always achieve the ideals. And so, I mean, just, just so you know that. We're just telling you the best practice and also that we don't always follow the best practice. Um, group dynamics can be really challenging, and you want someone who can appropriately manage this. We'll talk a little bit about how to handle challenging um, respondent situations. But first, um, let's, let's go to the beginning and, and look at our first steps in conducting the focus group. So now we're going to be really talking about some of the brass tacks. So um, the first step is to obtain consent. And, um, if you're university-based, you're going to need IRB approval for this to protect human subjects. If people need examples of consent forms, we're happy to share those. Let us know. 
Um, but in our case, we had parental consent prior to participation in our focus groups, and those consent forms were gathered by staff of programs prior. But at the beginning, we still get assent. Would you? Yeah, we um, will. We'll show this in a, a few slides as well. We have kind of a a background um, that we go through at the beginning of each focus group. And it does contain all of the um, aspects of informed consent, and we use that as kind of an oral assent process for the youth participants at the beginning of the session as well. And you also might want to collect some demographic information if age, gender, or other attributes are important. Design a, a very brief, short, half-page form that really requires no more than two or three minutes to complete and administer this before the meat of the focus group discussion starts, but we have found this to be really useful to have this. And here's kind of like an overview of, of what happens in the introduction, and we have all of this in a very nice background handout that, that you'll get after, um, after this session. Um, but, you know, the first step, you're going to introduce yourself and uh, the facilitator and the note takers. Um, we generally have at least one or two note takers. Mandy's going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, you then want to really lay out what's the purpose of the focus group, why you are asking these questions, review why these individuals were invited. For example, we're interested in discussing sexuality and health, and we want to talk to the experts, you. New York State Department of Health wants the information to better meet the health needs of young people. So, so really give them an idea of, of why they're there. Um, expectations. Lay this out. Let people know, you know, very specifically what's going to happen. You know, that, it, that the session will be 1.5 hours. There are no right or wrong answers here, and that we want to hear different perspectives and opinions, that you can talk directly to each other, not just to the facilitator, but make sure you speak one person at a time and make sure you are respectful to one another. Um, you have an option to say pass if you're called on and don't want to say anything, and um, you might be asked to let others in the group speak. So really kind of spelling out what, what is going to happen and some behavioral um, sort of ground rules for them. You can discuss um, also recording and confidentiality and, and let them know that the note takers are going to record their opinions and responses, but that no names are going to be recorded. You can say that we hope that you're going to be honest. Um, if you're recording it, let them know that you are tape recording it. Um, let them know that everything said in the focus group needs to be kept confidential. And please don't discuss what was said here today outside of the group. And then ask if they have any questions. And again, we have this all laid out very nicely in a handout for you in more detail. Oh, oh and here it is. So here's what you'll be getting. Um, so you could kind of use this and tweak it to your own purposes, but it's kind of nice to have it. It's, we call it the focus group introduction script. All right. Um, you know, it's, a, it's hard work being a facilitator. This is not an easy job. Um, they have to cover all the questions in a, in a specific time um, and make sure that those really key questions get addressed and to get all participants to talk and fully explain their answers. I mean, here are some helpful probes that you can use. Can you talk about that more? Help me understand what you mean. Can you give me an example? So um, it, it's just a tough job being a facilitator. So how about dealing with uh, challenging participants? We also have a nice handout on facilitation tips. but. Here's, um, I mean, th these are great. I mean, I'm sure we all know being in groups with these types of participants. The, the participant who is the self-appointed expert, well, you could say, thank you. What do other people think? Then you can absolutely have a dominator. We're all in groups where we see the dominator. And a way of dealing with a dominator is to say, okay, let's have some other comments. Um, the rambler. This is a really tough one. You know, the person who just doesn't stop. So you try to have eye contact, look at your watch, and jump in if they inhale, you know, but that can be that could be very tricky, the, the ramblers. 
Um, if you have a shy participant, you make eye contact, call on them, smile at them, um, or the participant who talks very quietly, ask them to repeat their responses more um, loudly. But, you know, another technique that, that we've um, done, if we have not a lot of people talking, we can just sort of, you know, stop for a minute and say, okay, I'm going to ask a question, and we're going to go around the group and just let everyone have an opinion now. So that can balance out these different, you know, types of participants who might be dominating or not speaking at all. So there's more, oh, here comes a facilitation. Um, uh, facilitation skills handout are some uh, nice little pointers here to, that we'll get, you'll get after the webinar. Anything you want to point out about this? And here's uh, a handout on general information interviewing skills that we'll also share with you after the webinar. Okay, Mandy. Okay, so now we've kind of talked about facilitating. Now we we're going to talk about recording responses. Um, as Jane mentioned, we usually have at least one or two note takers. So we'll have the um, Obviously, the facilitator is there, but that's their job. That's their only job is conducting the focus group, getting people to talk, making sure that they're covering all of the questions. Then our note takers are the ones who are documenting uh, the responses that come up in the group. And um, we've done this in a couple different ways. Honestly, I think taking notes by hand is kind of the least disruptive way to do this. But, um, you know, you can definitely also take notes via laptop. Um, audio or even possibly video recording is an option. I would, I would um, really encourage you to think about the level of detail that you need to capture and um, how and how you're going to use this information um, and the type of information you need. What we often do with our focus groups is we'll have two note takers and then we also audio record. But we really use the audio recording just to supplement the notes or find, you know, specific quotes or details. So um, we really don't only audio record because then you would really have to get a transcription of it, which is also uh, costly in terms of time and, and uh, resources. Uh, and the analysis of it can also take more time. So you really need to think if, if that's truly a, a big added benefit or if you want to primarily rely on the notes uh, taken by your two, one or two note takers in the room. I do always recommend that the, the group who is uh, conducting the focus group debrief shortly after the focus group right after would be great. So if you have two note takers, the note takers can kind of compare responses, but also the facilitator can kind of jump in and um, add anything that maybe the note takers missed. Um, I do recommend that the note takers be part of the group. So if you're sitting in a circle, they're actually part of the circle as well, but we would want to have the facilitator and the note takers kind of spread out so it's, they're not all grouped together. Um, this, this helps them kind of just become more integrated with the group, but also has the very practical added advantage of you can hear better. <laughs> if you have a participant or two who's kind of quiet, um, you might not have someone who's on this side of the room, you know, be able to hear. So it's great to have them, them a bit spread out. Um, uh, kind of going back to that debriefing idea, uh, it's really great to have the facilitator be part of that conversation as well because sometimes the note takers are so busy documenting that they might not be picking up on some of the nonverbals that are happening in the room. And the facilitator who is actively engaging with the participants both in conversation but also with nonverbal communication might, might note those things. So there was a question here, do you find it better to just let people jump in and be aware of those not contributing to get their thoughts after the others, or do you tend to systematically go around the room? It does kind of vary a bit. I think it, um, you can kind of play it by ear as the group is, is happening. Um, if you have a, a participant who just really hasn't contributed at all, um, sometimes what I have done is I'll deliberately say, uh, what do others think, and kind of turn and make eye contact with that person and, and let them non-verbally know, I'm making space for you to jump in to this question. Um, or as Jane uh, 
said too, you know, you can say, okay, this next question is for everyone. So I'm just going to kind of go around the circle and we'll hear from everyone on this. Yeah, I, I generally wouldn't do that unless I really see there are, are dominators and then there are people who aren't just saying anything. I mean, because that's very different than a conversation that you mm -hmm. want to have happen, you know, and if it's, if it's not happening, then I would do that go around. But right. It's, it's kind of amazing how much just eye contact encourages yeah. people to contribute to the conversation. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the, this is just kind of a quick snapshot of some of what's in the note-taking tips handout that will be available to you after um, the, the session today. So um, the beginning of this also has kind of a things to keep in mind, make sure you bring this to the focus group kind of a section. And then at the bottom um, uh, of the second page, these details kind of start. So again, you know, you want to make sure that your note takers are really very familiar with the questions as well. Um, we often use the focus group, group script and questions as the note taking template. Um, and notes really should just be in bulleted form. You don't necessarily need to capture things verbatim, especially if you're auto, audio recording, and you can go back to that to get detail. Um, but one thing that is unique about a focus group that you do want to kind of um, keep track of in your notes is if many people kind of second uh, a particular sentiment. So um, if one person offers an idea and several in the group are nodding in, in um, kind of agreement with that idea, or if uh, it's clear that other people are, are feeling the same way. So that's definitely something to note. Um, it's also interesting to note if um, there's conversation between two participants that is really um, very different opinions. So again, you don't need to record names, but you can say participant one and then participant two. So you're kind of capturing some of that dialogue. And as Jane had mentioned kind of near the beginning, this is an opportunity to kind of identify shifts in opinion or viewpoints. Um, and so you want to make sure that your notes are able to capture that kind of information. Um, so now we have all of our great data. We've conducted the focus groups. What do we do with it? Um, you Again, you need to think about kind of the nature of the data that you have. Um, do you have audio recordings? Uh, do you have notes in addition to that? Do you have consent or permission forms that you need to have securely stored? So um, where do those things actually live? And then who needs access to them? Everything that we do for a focus group is part of a team project. So it's really critical for us to have things stored so that multiple members of our team can access the information at the same time. Um, but that's really driven by what your analysis plan is. Maybe it's not critical that a group have access to this information. But these are just kind of things to consider as you think about your data management plan. And also long term, you know, is this something that people will need access to six months from now, a year from now? Um, if it's living on one person's computer, that's going to really limit access. So just some things to think about there. And then thinking about your analysis, again, you know, kind of coming back to the purpose. Um, why am I gathering this information? What, what questions do I want to answer? Beyond, you know, thinking even more big picture than the specific questions that were asked in the focus group, but really getting to the, the root question of this entire project. Um, there are a variety of frameworks that you can use to analyze these data, um, but regardless of the approach you use, you want to be systematic. It's likely that you kind of want to continuously revisit the system that you're using to analyze this and make sure that you're really capturing uh, the nuance um, and the, the, the breadth of responses. Um, so here under frameworks, you see some particular uh, approaches that you could use. One thing that we're often doing with our focus group analysis is this kind of constant comparative method. So we're really looking at responses um, within a particular focus group, but also across focus groups. Um, we also have uh, usually many of our team members or, you know, two to three people are coding our uh, focus group notes. So we want to make sure that they're doing it in a similar way. So again, just kind of constantly looking at 
How are we grouping this information? How are we categorizing this? What meaning are we taking from that? We're really always kind of looking for overarching themes or themes across subgroups. So what are the different patterns that we see um, across focus groups or across uh, different participant groups? Um, so, you know, as Jane mentioned, we could spend a whole other workshop talking about data analysis, but these are just kind of some broad things to keep in mind here. This is just an example of one really low-tech way <laughs> that we were um, coding some focus group data. This, uh, what we did was we pulled out excerpts from the notes and connected them to this specific question. Um, so each of these excerpts was assigned a statement ID number, just to kind of keep this all together. And then you can see here in columns E and F, that's where our coders were applying our coding categories. So what we did first was um, reviewed uh, at least a subset of the focus group notes and as a team um, came to consensus on the codes that we wanted to use for these data. And then when we got to this point, what we did here in Excel was um, kind of break them apart. So each, uh, each critical excerpt received a code. And as I said, we often have multiple people coding. So uh, we had at least two people code everything. And then we got them back together. And they looked at how they had coded each excerpt and came to agreement. So that's kind of a, a nice illustration of this. Um, constant comparative method and kind of coming coming to consensus on codes. Um, so that's one really kind of like low tech, maybe a little bit labor intensive way to do it. Um, but we also use uh, a, a program called Deduce for a lot of our qualitative analysis. Um, so this is the landing page of their website. Um, and Deduce is really designed, it was designed to be a mixed method data analysis program. Um, so it does, it definitely does a lot. Uh, but some of the features of Deduce that make it really, really great for our work is that it's all web-based. So um, uh, all members of our team have easy access to the, the media files that we're coding and working with. Um, and also because it's web-based, you always have the most up-to-date version of the program. So there's no, uh, no issues with one member of the team having a different version from the, from the next. Um, but also because it's web-based, we're able to have multiple people working with a project all at the same time. So um, many advantages to deduce. Again, I could talk a lot more about this particular program um, if people are interested. There are definitely other qualitative uh, data analysis programs available out there. In vivo is one. Um, Atlas is another big one. Uh, but for us, we found this one to be really uh, an inexpensive and very functional um, alternative. And this is just a, a snapshot of kind of inside one of the projects um, in Deduce. And so um, what's really neat about this program is that you can see overarching themes and you can see some, you know, what are the, the most common themes quickly by looking at some of their visualizations. But you can always get back to the excerpts. You can see kind of in the, the middle column there in the bottom. Um, the, uh, you can see the forest and the trees in this, which is one aspect of this program that I really like. So you're able to see the big themes, but then also really immediately get right back to the raw data, um, which is helpful when you are kind of coming together and, and pulling together a synthesis of your findings. So that's another tool that you Okay, might use. so now I'm just going to, in this final section before we do uh, open it up for more questions, is to just give you an example of, of how we've reported results um, and um, focus group findings. And so this is, again, that big project that we did um, for New York State around teens and sexual health. This was a huge project. We actually did 27 focus groups across New York State. That was a lot. Um, they really, the health department really wanted to hear from youth all over the state, so upstate, downstate, rural, urban, suburban, new immigrants, LGBTQ, runaway, homeless, foster care, you know, I, just the whole, they wanted a, just a whole variety of, of young people. 
Um, and so these were the questions. Um, the, they were based around um, where do young people get information um, about sexual health and what are the best ways to learn about it? What are barriers to getting accurate information? What is the information that you really need now? And then recommendations that how can we make things better with a particular focus on disparities and differences. So since we had a lot of groups, one way of reporting the information uh, or, or recording the data was how many of the focus groups discussed a particular theme. So um, here we asked them, what's the best source of information? And, and in 20 of the focus groups, people talked about schools. Schools should be the best disseminators of it. Um, but medical providers were also really important um, sources for getting information. But when we uh, then we also include um, more qualitative data. And here's just an example about people who talked about, they mentioned parents. Some people talked about parents in a really positive way. And they said, you know, parents know you the best. Um, they know how to talk to you. But then other people said, but parents can give you bad information. Like if you have sex, you'll get cancer. Um, and so this is um, sort of flushing out uh, comments through qualitative quotes. Um, here's another way when we talked about recommendations, when the youth talked about what were their recommendations for improving sexual health in, for, their, for young people in the state. And these were the different areas of recommendations that they, that they mentioned. Um, so here's just a listing of all of the recommendations. And then here's breaking it out more. Well, what did they say explicitly about sex education? And they made recommendations about start times and intensity and the requirements and how to improve the quality and, and talked about teachers' qualities who deliver um, these classes. Um, they also recommended increasing school-wide visibility. So these are just ways of sort of listing what we learned um, and we're able to put in reports that made it very accessible. And I, as I said, um, the, the findings were incorporated. Um, so we have now been uh, talking for um, over an hour, and um, we'd like to open it up um, to the chat. If there are other things that you want to know, um, here are some resources. And Dick Kruger, has his stuff is like, the best. Uh, if you have to get one thing, I would recommend Focus Groups, a Practical Guide for Applied Research. He's really the focus group guru in the field and has really made some terrific resources to help. Um, the Community Toolbox is another place to get um, resources. And there's the, the website for Deduce that Mandy um, talked about. And here's our follow-up information. But let's open it up and see if there are other things that people want to ask us while you've got us for a few more minutes. Yeah, Mary, Carol had asked a question earlier, and I think you addressed this a little bit, but while you're facilitating, do you find it better to just let people jump in and be aware of those not contributing to get their thoughts after the others, or do you just systematically go around the room? Yeah, so we, uh, it really kind of depends on the dynamic and what's happening in that moment. Um, uh, you know, I do think that that's an opportunity for uh, Using eye contact to really encourage participation, you can say one of those um, questions like, you know, what do others think? And just kind of, uh, you know, make eye contact with those who haven't really been speaking up. Um, you have that uh, other option of kind of going around the room and, and asking for responses from everyone. Of course, always allowing people to, to pass if they really want to. Um, just, again, making sure that they feel comfortable in the, in the focus group. And Diana's saying, our participants would be from all over the state, and we may be able to piggyback on a conference, but do you have any experience using group Skype or other online methods to conduct a focus group? Yeah, somebody brought that up um, when we did the workshop, too. I mean, there are people who are doing virtual focus groups. It's not something that we have done. It's certainly possible with, with new technologies. I could see Zoom being... Um, uh, a way of, of, of doing it. We have not, but I, I think we will, I think we're going to do it at some point. I'm sure we're going we're gonna to do this. I would recommend if you uh, do end up doing a virtual one, 
that if it's at all possible to also have video in addition to audio, that oh, that would yeah. be a really great addition. Just be, there are so many, you know, nonverbal things that are going on. I think we've all had that experience of a conference call where, you, you know, it's hard to jump in anyway or you're not sure, if you don't want to speak over. Um, having visuals really helps with that. Um, and you're able to, to pick up some of those nonverbal cues as well. Um, so that would be my... And you probably um, want it on the smaller side mm -hmm. than like 12 people, like, you know, six people, something smaller. But, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely the future for us, but we're, we're not there yet. <laughs> but if you, if you have a conference, I mean, that p does provide an opportunity as like to, bi to piggyback and say, hey, we're all going to be all of these people here um, and um, let's like you know try to invite some to a session with us to do this I mean I've seen that at conferences and that that would be a you know really great opportunity and Nancy is asking what are some other ways to recruit participants well it depends a bit on your your target group you know who who you want to have uh, participate I would really recommend using existing networks wherever possible. So if you can make connections with organizations or programs that work with people that you're interested in uh, hearing from, that's a, a really good strategy. I was just going to say, did you, know, did you talk about um, how the ideal like in the literature on focus groups is that people should not know each other? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, but not always possible. It's really not always possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So other ways of re recruiting, yeah, use your networks. Um, it's um, the if you can ha the incentives have well, for us have been really uh, essential, mm -hmm. um, but that requires you know having resources behind you and. Um, but I don't know. Are there, do other people um, who are participating in the webinar have some? Um, ideas on, on recruitment strategies since you're all kind of dealing with you know sort of similar environments. Maybe others have um, good ideas you want to yeah. type in. We'll yeah. see if people type in some mm -hmm. answers. Okay. And Katie is also asking, um, we want to get community input for public library strategic plan, so we'll try for participants from teens through senior citizens. Is a consent form necessary for a group like this? Uh, for us, it would be because we're connected with the university. If you and your organization are using it for like planning purposes, program planning, strategic planning, um, it, it may not require uh, you know, like an IRB review, it's not a research project, so uh, I wouldn't really fall under the purview of that. I always would recommend that you still kind of incorporate some of those aspects of consent uh, in your introduction to the group and make sure people kind of know what they're getting into and that they agree to participate in that. And that they're not forced to answer questions that they don't want to answer, mm -hmm. you know. Wow. Great. Thank you so much, Jane and Mandy. Sure. You're welcome.